Perfect. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, uh, thanks for joining us tonight uh, for this presentation about our habitat restoration program and our river guardian program and a little bit on our river discovery program. Uh, my name is Travis Williams and I'm executive director of Willamette Riverkeeper. Uh, just so you know, you're at the right place here. And um, uh, Willamette Riverkeeper was uh, founded in uh, 1996 and um, we, work on a whole range of things in the Willamette system, uh, principally Clean Water Act issues, habitat restoration, river education, um, toxics issues, uh, fish passage at the US Army Corps dams, and a whole bunch of other stuff, as you can imagine. So uh, we have a staff of uh, eight and an office in Eugene and one in Portland. Uh, and we own some land in Benton County and Yamhill, two, two uh, parcels in uh, Yamhill County as well. Um, so just giving you a really brief picture of, of our nonprofit. Um, but tonight we're here to focus on uh, those program areas I mentioned. And I think uh, it's going to be um, a good presentation. You'll, if you don't know much about this, these aspects of our work, uh, it's a great way to really dive in and learn. Um, we'll have a chance to ask questions, I think, at the end of the presentation. Um, there is a chat uh, feature here that you can feel free to use and ask questions as we go along. Uh, and if it makes sense, uh, folks will pick that up as they're going. Otherwise, we'll answer questions at the end of the presentation, as I said. Um, so thanks for being here tonight. And thanks for the folks from Tualatin Riverkeeper, uh, Mark and Jan, who are uh, in this presentation as well. Uh, good to see you all. Um, and just for perspective, uh, across the United States, there's probably over 250 riverkeeper, baykeeper, and coastkeeper organizations. We are all totally independent, uh, but we share uh, the name and uh, at least aspects of the approach to our work, which leads with the Clean Water Act. Uh, throughout the world, uh, there's probably another 100 or so uh, organizations that have that keeper name. Um, and of course, not everyone enjoys the use of the Clean Water Act, uh, but they'll use the related applicable laws to advance clean water and healthy habitat. And um, it all kind of goes from there. So it's great to have um, uh, Jan and Mark uh, in the, uh, watching the presentation tonight. Um, and they incidentally were formed in 1992 uh, as I think one of the very, very, very first entities that used that name and then were incorporated later on into the uh, the waterkeeper movement, just like we were. So we were the 13th group. Um, so anyway, thanks again. And I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Dickinson and Vanessa Heilman. Uh, Richard Dickinson is our habitat restoration manager and Vanessa is our habitat restoration associate. So I'll let you two take it away. Great, just waiting for the screen to come up. So thanks tons for joining us tonight. Um, my, my name is, once again, is Richard Dickinson. I'm the restoration manager for Willamette Riverkeeper. And um, I would, I, my preferred pronouns are he and him. Vanessa and I very much look forward to sharing information about the many accomplishments, providing an overview, a short overview of, of the breadth of our programs as well as taking a deeper dive into one of our projects, the Gale Ackerman Wildlife Area, 290-acre <laughs> area west of Salem. But before we delve into this program, we would like to first acknowledge that the natural areas we are currently restoring once belonged to and were stewarded by indigenous people in this region. Taken over by non-now-dominant culture, the uh, resulting land clearance, farming, aggregate extraction, and control of the river has allowed these natural systems to deteriorate. We strive to learn from people who have a longer history of stewarding this land than we have. So taking a look at the slide, it's, it's actually of Willamette Mission State Park, not Gale Ackerman Wildlife Area. Behind these eager young folks are some fairly tall cottonwood trees, as well as uh, a lot of native um, shrubs. These actually were planted in February of 2018 and 2019. 
and I never cease to be amazed, given the right conditions, how well things grow. Um, you might also note that we have an eager group of masked high school students from North Salem High School. And Vanessa was out them about a month ago, about three weeks ago, doing one of our first stewardship projects since the pandemic began. So we're finally resurfacing as far as the outward facing part of our organization. Meanwhile, we've done a ton of work of restoration work in our areas. Next slide. So hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Heilman, um, Willard Riverkeeper's Restoration Associate. Um, I go by the pronouns she, her. So we're pretty pleased and really proud of all of our accomplishments um, this past year. I came on board this last September and um, have also been involved with Willamette Riverkeeper in the work we do for a while now. So I've been getting to learn the intricacies of our restoration activities at Willamette Mission State Park um, and Gail Acterman Wildlife Area. And this past summer, I got to volunteer with uh, our surveys on the Willamette to catalog aquatic invasive weeds and spent the best first day of a job ever hand pulling an aquatic invasive weed yellow floating heart with Michelle on the river. Um, I look forward to learning more about our efforts at Minto Brown in Salem and helping with the unveiling of our new Wapato Revival website. So this particular slide is a quick snapshot of each of our active restoration projects. Um, as you can see, we have a number of sites we're actively working on. Um, hopefully y'all are familiar with our largest scale project, which is Willamette Mission State Park. Um, we are now entering our final phase seven on this site and to date have installed over 514,000 native plants throughout the landscape. So. So a lot. Um, and I, just to note from the slide, um, the 295 acre figure refers to what we've worked on this year alone. So all in all, uh, phase seven is completed. We will have worked across 752 acres of this park. Um, but due to the scale and scope of this project, it's one we've shared a lot about and have celebrated a lot of successes. So we thought for tonight's presentation, we would share a gem that many people don't know about, which is Gale Actorman Wildlife Area. Next slide. So this is one of my favorite pictures of the back channel when it's not rip roaring through the, through the back of the island. Um, once again, Gail Ackerman Wildlife Area, a 298-acre site formerly known as Hayden Island. That's Hayden Island on the Willamette, not Hayden Island on the Columbia. Um, well, if many of you can easily visit Willamette Mission State Park and see significant work there, um, it, public access to Gail Ackerman is a little bit more difficult. It is limited to access by boat. And even then, mostly hunters are the ones who in, um, access the interior of the island. So it makes it a perfect wildlife refuge in so many regards. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, with other supporters involved with the Wild, Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program, purchased the land in 2016. Restoration, restoration activities began in 2018. So we've only been working on site for a little over three years. Next slide. So this slide provides a little context of the island. Um, the map in the bottom right corner shows that Gail Acterman is west and upstream of Salem. Um, when you look at the picture, Eola Hills is in the background and Salem would be in the upper right corner. Um, you can also note the agricultural fields to the left and the gravel mining to the, to the right. Um, this aerial photo was taken by a drone in 2017 uh, because much of the wildlife area was inaccessible. So um, it was covered with dense thickets of blackberry, reed canary grass, um, English ivy, and a lot of other non-native weeds. Next slide. So a gem in the rough. 
quite quickly becoming a little bit more polished. It's actually looking much better than this photo. I think it must have been daunting. I was I was on site in 2018, but not entering it the way this person was, where there was a shoulder high reed canary grass and way overhead high blackberry that you just had to hack your way into and figure out what the interior looked like. Um, our task is to return it to a healthy functioning ecosystem that benefits winter steelhead, spring chinook, Oregon chub, red-legged frogs, western pond turtles, western painted turtles, beaver, and a large variety of avian species, just to name a few. We had a nesting pair of bald eagles in residence this past year. So the ecological processes we'll delve into a little bit as we go through the presentation, but we're encouraging sediment deposition, return of large woody debris, enhanced water quality, and uh, returning it to its more natural state. One of the foundations of this ecosystem is native plants, and it's amplifying their presence on the island as a major method of affecting change. Next slide. So as you can see from this slide, our current work um, in phases one and two is focused on repairing many of the harmful impacts caused after decades of farming and aggregate extraction on the site. Um, it's so fulfilling and uh, wonderful to be on the forefront of mitigating and reversing these impacts through our restoration actions on the island but I'm also particularly excited um, to help develop our outreach and educational opportunities that we've planned with partners and funders. So, you know, we recognize the importance of bringing our youth and different communities to these project sites um, for hands-on learning um, and, you know, to learn why the work we do is so important. So this gives, you know, a greater understanding of what restoration really entails and also a chance to help with our efforts, which really builds a connection to the land. Um, you know, we can always use more people to be the eyes, ears, and voice of the Willamette River. Next slide. Start with the end in mind, I think the cliche goes. So in figuring out what type of actions we need to take, it's important to have a vision for what the wildlife area will look like in the future. In 2018, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and other stakeholders adopted a 78-page management plan, really a, a, a hefty document that articulates this course of action. This map of all 290 acres of the island simplifies it to some extent, but what you, what you can see are the many management units. We've certainly divided it down into management units to be able to talk about it and to make it more manageable. And we have planting plans and future end desired goals for each one of the habitat, habitat types in each management unit. What is not super clear in this map is that there's a back channel there that runs between the agricultural field to the left and the main part of the island to the right. This back channel we'll talk a little bit more about later, but that's why, that's why it's an island. Um, this aerial shot incidentally shows uh, annual crops there off to the west of the island. That is now 2,700 acres of perennial crops, and most of it is covered in organic blueberry, which actually is really pleasing. Next, please. So looking at these accomplishments um, that we've we've achieved so far at Gail Ackerman, um, you can kind of get a better sense of the course of action we've taken. Um, our restoration re revegetation process usually involves three stages. So the first stage is, is site preparation, which usually lasts about two to three years. Um, this involves first cutting the non-native plants to reduce biomass, then carefully using you know, targeted applications of herbicide to ensure the root systems are dead while also killing the invasive plants that continue to germinate from the seed bank. Um, the second step is planting and this occurs in winter and spring. So after our site preparation, 
uh, when, when there's usually plenty of water to help establish their roots. Um, sometimes the project will also, you know, have staggered plantings to create growth at different ages, um, as well as different canopy layers with different shrubs or native trees. And the third step is plant establishment, which is conducted over a three to five year period. And this involves focusing on selective weed abatement until the young natives are large enough to outcompete the non-natives um, in the landscape. Next slide, please. So many restoration practitioners bear witness to a process we call natural recruitment or natural regeneration. It's kind of fancy nomenclature for the emergence of native grasses, forbs, shrubs, and trees that we did not plant. Incidentally, this is um, in looking at metrics basin wide, this is something that is very difficult to capture. And the science community wrestles with uh, including it in um, their thinking about different sites. But it's the simple act of removing weed cover and reducing weed pressure from a restoration site that can lay groundwork for what is about to be a robust process of natural regeneration of um, plants from seed um, that we didn't plant. It is after site prep is nearing completion that the magic of natural recruitment really starts to occur. All of a sudden, we see start seeing native plants appear that we did not introduce to the site, primarily herbaceous annuals as well as perennials. Next slide. Thank you, Heather. Um, the lower left picture there, it's, it's a little bit difficult to see it into that basin, but we've got um, acres of Ludwigia just smothering native Wapato there. Um, it's, a, it's a growing problem throughout the Willamette River sister and you know, we are striving to certainly put, protect, protect the best habitat, the most worthy or for, for, um, for natural life that's in the basin. Um, the picture above shows the Wapato resurgence after three years of careful application of herbicide on the Ludwigia. That's two times a year, two entries a year for three years. It's even looking more robust right now after four years. Almost an afterthought, what is not pictured is we found Nymphoides peltata, also called, a, Vanessa alluded it to her earlier, yellow floating heart on the site. This is an Oregon Department of Agriculture designated class A noxious weed, considered worthy of the status of early detection and rapid response, meaning there are few enough populations on the river to deserve immediate attention. The intent being to thwart its spread before it becomes a large problem. Willamette River Keeper has been surveying most of the river for Nymphoides peltata since a little 2015, a little bit later. Some of you may have been involved. Of the 17 sites that we're monitoring and assisting with treatment, the population at Gale Acton is the most downstream population that is known. And I'll have you know that it's, it's we're talking about just a couple couch sized, car sized patches, so not big at all. Next, please. So this is a picture of the back channel at Gale Ackerman during um, the high water period. So people sometimes forget that floods are a natural occurrence for our rivers um, and floodplains are an important part of our river system. So uh, we, we really need floodplain forests throughout the landscapes. And there are a number of benefits to, ha to having healthy floodplain forests. Um, one, keeping our communities safe. So restoring floodplains allows the river to have more room to spread out and slow the flow down in the channel. Um, it reduces the impact of flood damage in urban areas that could, could potentially be devastating to property owners, roads, or people. Um, water temperatures. So as the water is slowed down, it's captured in the sediment, which then can help keep the water temperatures cooler in those hotter months. Um, habitat, they provide productive habitat for plants, wildlife, fish, and other aquatic species that are all important to the ecosystem. We, ha we have two listed endangered species of samanids that depend on this habitat 
during their migration and their life cycle. Um, Floodplains help improve, improve water quality. So they act as a natural filter in that they absorb the pollutants and chemicals that could be harmful to people or fish or wildlife and other plants. Um, they also trap important nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, and iron um, into the soils. And this also plays a role in water quality and also creates more fertile so soils for plants or crops in agriculture. Um, and lastly, floodplains also help recharge our groundwater system. So during these floods, the water is captured and stored as the groundwater supply um, can, can produce, and which this helps us in years that might be drier, um, like last year was a very dry year. So we need this groundwater supply to, to, for, to help the plants. Next slide, please. Funders really take a look at a site like this and want to see that it floods occasionally. Um, a few things to point out about this slide. The graph on the upper left represents annual hydrograph for 2018, 2019, 2020. That uh, strange red bar through the middle of it represents the point where the back channel is at activated, where it starts to flow. Um, so it's about 21,000 CFS on the Salem gauge, or 10.5 feet, that we really, that Gail Ackerman becomes an island. Um, if you take a look carefully at uh, the summer flows in the middle and the winter and uh, fall flows on each side, you can see that the peaks exceed that red line. Um, they, that ch back channel's activated for, oh, I'd say a good 90 days a year on average, more or less, depending on the year. That map on the right, the colors there represent about 14 feet of elevation difference. The red map, the red on the map is the higher elevation. The teal colored is, um, that that's elevation when the back channel starts to flow. So when you see, um, if, you, if you take a look at the, all that northern part of the island, there's about the same um, elevation as the back channel. And that whole northern part of the island then becomes a large, if you will, eddy, where uh, fish can find high water refugia, where they have forage opportunities because of all the web, food webs that we've created there um, that, that used to be naturally occurring. It is during the flood of uh, April 9, uh, 2019, this island was largely underwater. It was probably only the tips of the red parts that were above water. So um, it's, a, it's a feature that gets inundated quite a bit. So when viewed together, the combination of the elevation map and the hydrograph show how much of a dynamic interaction there is between riparian areas of the floodplain and the river itself. Next, Heather, thank you. So this is a diagram which represents a healthy floodplain forest ecosystem. So as you can see, both the riparian and aquatic environment contributes to the system and they also impact each other. Um, when we think about what makes up a healthy floodplain forest, we wanna see a complex age of of classes of native tree species like black cottonwood, um, Oregon ash, and then underneath the different canopy layers, they should be filled with dense native shrubs and herbaceous, herbaceous plants. So the diversity in structure and species is really what holds this web together. So if you think about the black cottonwood, um, the canopy cover of its leaves help moderate stream temperatures and provide shade for fish and other aquatic species. Once those leaves drop, they then become a food source for aquatic invertebrates. The tree's trunk and branches create cavities that provide cover for much of our wildlife, like deer, beaver, um, elk, and nesting habitat for birds. And the tree's roots play a huge role in stream and floodplain stabilization to mitigate erosion. 
And then once the wood debris falls into the river, that can also help trap sediments and shape the river channels, which creates habitat for fish and other aquatic species. So it really is an integrated system. And as you can see at Gale Ackerman, um, it's one that is inundated annually. So we are really focusing our efforts on repairing the natural floodplain forest ecosystem there. So this web, this web can continue and we can bring back habitat for our native fish and the wildlife and plants. Next, Heather. So site preparation at Gale Ackerman has taken longer than anticipated. Um, normally it takes about two to three years and it certainly took three in this case, largely because of the amount of non-native species and the quantity of non-native seed in the seed bank. We are currently in phases one and two, we're currently in the midst of two to three years of planting. As, so what was planned is two years and the third year will be interplanting. And we have begun plant establishment treatments. Um, that is of course, uh, abating the non-native weeds until the native, weed, the native plants are free to grow. We have currently have funding for only a couple years of plant establishment. Um, in the ideal world, we'd have funds for five years of plant establishment total. At the end of the first number of phases of this project, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife will assume sole responsibility for the site. In order to ensure that the site is as healthy as possible over the long term, there are a few unfunded actions that we've proposed. These proposed actions are outlined in this slide. We have applied to and are hoping to receive funding from Oregon Water Watershed Enhancement Board for phase three of this project. By the end, uh, to just talk about in comparison, by the end of this phase two, we'll have invested about $500,000 in grant funds at Gale Actum and Wildlife Area. This is the little bit mighty sister to Willamette Mission State Park, where after the end of phase seven, we will have invested over $2 million in restoration funds. Next, please. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has a desire and an obligation to steward the Gale Ackerman wildlife in perpetuity. Hopefully our restorations actions will have set them up for success. In smaller print here, you can barely read it, but I'd like to do a shout out for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Bonneville Power Administration, Trust for Public Lands, Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, Myron Memorial Trust, Arbor Day Foundation, R. Franco Restoration, Integrated Resource Management, Bonneville Environment Foundation, Friends of Gail Ackerman, AgriCare, Wisdom of the Elders, and Northwest Youth Corps. It really takes a team and you are part of that team. Thank you, definitely for your support. Next slide. We appreciate you all so much for joining us tonight and um, just for being curious about the work we do. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Richard and Vanessa, great work. Um, so now we're gonna to turn to our River Guardian program and a bit of our River Discovery program. And I'd like to introduce Michelle Emmons, who manages our South Valley program and Amanda Gagos, who is our outreach manager. Thanks, Heather. Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Emmons. I'm the Upper Willamette Watershed Program Manager. And uh, tonight, Amanda and myself are going to walk you through some of the amazing community engagement work that we've been doing over this last year. Uh, but before we get started, let me talk to you a little bit about our River Guardians Program. Um, our program here was established in 2015, started out in the Eugene Springfield area and now we've grown the programs into 2021 throughout the Willamette Basin uh, with 
Amanda working in the Salem and Portland areas, and I work in the uh, Corvallis, Albany, Eugene, Springfield, and upper watershed areas. Our program is focused on three main uh, ways to move forward with stewardship and advocacy. Um, trash cleanups um, and public advocacy for resources. Um, we also do monitoring and communications, um, which include looking at dump sites and reporting those, uh, monitoring illegal camping and working with stakeholders to address some of the problems associated with that. Uh, monitoring water quality and water quality issues, reporting that and working with stakeholders to address anything that comes up. We've also done wildlife surveys and even rescues. Um, and this year we implemented a partnership program with the Oregon Department uh, of Fish and Wildlife. Um, their Keep Oregon Rivers Clean stations have been installed across 13 locations um, in the basin. So that's kind of exciting. Um, we also survey and treat aquatic invasive species, assisting our restoration program. Um, and within that, we do education such as uh, aquatic invasive species ID workshops, annual surveys that we assist our restoration folks with. Uh, sometimes we implement paddle and pole or ivy or other terrestrial weed removal um, in riparian areas as well as implementing native planting and seeding projects. And the pictures that you see up here uh, represent a trash removal and paddle and pole where we took out some Ludwigia um, in Delta Ponds area. And then in the upper right there, um, that was a blue heron rescue with a broken wing that we implemented with Cascade Raptors. And down at the bottom there, you'll see a duckling rescue. It had a, a hook, uh, in its mouth that we also took to the Cascade Raptor Center. And then we were able to reunite that duckling with its family. That's a, a nice little story there. So we do a lot more than just pick up trash. Next slide. You might wonder like, what are some of the benefits that the community uh, receives from these programs aside from our riverbanks being cleaner? Well, we have an activated and engaged community meaning that these programs really are community driven by the people who live on the Willamette River. Uh, we, once we get in and we do the cleaning and some of the restoration projects, including invasive removal or native plants or seeding, um, it helps to provide clean, safe functioning uh, environment for recreation, as well as improved habitats for fish and other wildlife. Um, we also have increased access to resources for all river users. So folks that enjoy riding their bikes or hiking around parks, trails and the riverfront, um, having good safe access at boat ramps. Um, we're also working on um, improving some of the other takeouts along our areas here. And um, also just overall an increased sense of well-being in our communities where they're able to contribute to clean water initiatives. Next slide. Hello, um, my name is Amanda Gallegos. My pronouns are she, her. And as Travis said, I'm the education and outreach manager. Um, I'm up here based in Portland. Um, so just to dig into a little bit of our programs, many of you are probably familiar with the Great Willamette Cleanup. Um, it's an annual effort that we've hosted for quite some time now. Um, it started as a single day event that we would host throughout the, throughout the valley and with COVID has really transformed in the way um, in the way that it's worked for the last couple of years for 2020 and in 2021. Um, we just ended the event um, or had the event this last October um, and ended up doing an entire month of cleanups, um, which has really allowed um, our staff to work within multiple different communities. Um, it's allowed for our volunteers to become more engaged throughout the cleanups um, by being able to attend more events, um, as well as our partners having the opportunity to participate in more events all month long. Um, one component of the, sorry, go back. Um, one component of the Great Willamette cleanup is quarantines. Um, it's where folks who, um, it originally started when folks who were interested in participating in cleanups, um, but were just limiting themselves to working within their certain pods. Um, Willamette Riverkeeper will set them up with supplies and maybe advice on where to clean up. Um, and so people are welcome to participate in that way as well. 
And the Great Willamette Cleanup is community funded and then led by Willamette Riverkeeper as well as the partners. Um, and 2021, so just this last October, was actually the 13th annual event. Um, and the photos that you see on this slide are from the headwaters in Oak Ridge from a cleanup that Michelle had led. Uh, that top photo is a common photo that we do see. Um, so it's the pool four photo. That middle one is a during of that same site. And then that last photo is the volunteers um, with the after, which is pretty impressive. And next slide. Um, so to back to this, um, this year's Great Willamette Cleanup, we hosted 25 events with our partners. Um, partners often include city organizations, clubs, businesses, individuals, and also the quarantines, as I mentioned. Uh, the photo on the right that you see um, is one of the largest events that we've had in the Portland area. We ended up picking up 18 yards of trash along the Holgate Channel, uh, which is actually where we'll be having an event tomorrow. So if anybody is still interested, there's space available um, for the Holgate Channel cleanup in the Portland area. Um, the Great Willamette cleanup also serves as just kind of a, an end cap for the cleanup season as it um, a time of year right before the river starts to rise. So it's kind of a last opportunity um, where a lot of the locations that we work are a bit easier accessible to remove garbage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and next slide. Uh, the spring for your river cleanup is kind of um, to an opposite effect. It's a nice kickoff series, <clears throat> new to this year actually, um, where the water levels start to drop and it's easier to start getting in back into some of those spaces to remove garbage. <clears throat> Um, this year was the first year that we did have this cleanup series. Um, it was really born out of COVID um, with the need to address positive community engagement stewardship um, after not having the opportunity to do so throughout 2020. Um, this event series, it launched on Earth Day and lasted for six weeks, where again, we had the opportunity to work with a lot of different partners, clubs, businesses, individuals, and then quarantines as well. The photo excuse me, the photo that you see on the left is um, with a team of folks from WILD, which is one of our financial sponsors, um, which is always a great opportunity to work with those folks. And then on the right is Michelle with some of the city councilors in Eugene for a cleanup. Next slide. Um, so for the Spring for Your River cleanup, we had 29 events in six weeks, which broke down to 14 events on the lower river which is the Portland through Salem area, and then 15 events on the upper river, which is south of Salem. And this series was funded by Travel Oregon as a part of their Destination Ready Grants. Next slide. Um, so moving to Portland specific cleanups. Um, in the year 2021, we had 26 events and were able to work with 336 volunteers to remove 433 needles and 90 yards of trash. And that bottom left photo is one of the more recent cleanups that we had on the Holgate Channel and actually the same location that we'll be working in um, tomorrow. Next slide. Um, within Portland, there's a lot of folks that we're working with on a regular basis, which includes Portland Parks and Rec, um, United by Blue, Travel Oregon, and then lots of local businesses, including um, financial sponsors, including Wild and Fortis Construction. And next. Um, there's also a lot of different locations that we're working in throughout Portland. And um, you can see the yellow dots are primary places that we'll focus on, which are Kelly Point Park, Selwood Riverfront Park, the East Bank Esplanade, Springwater Corridor, the Holgate Channel, Ross Island, and Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge. And then on the west side of the river, uh, Tom McCall River Road Park. Next. And new to this year, um, we've put more effort into working in the Salem area um, and looking forward to doing so next year as well. We ended up having 10 cleanup events in the area with 83 volunteers removing eight needles and 28 yards of trash. Next slide. Um, for these cleanups, we're working a lot with um, Oregon Parks, the City of Kaiser, the Mid Willamette Outreach Group, Travel Oregon, and Horseshoe Lake Hops Farm. Next slide. And here again, you'll see a map of the spaces that we are spending the majority of our time. 
which is Kaiser Rapids Park, San Salvador Beach, Wheatland Bar, and Minto Brown, as well as Wallace Marine. That didn't make fun. Next slide. Oh, Michelle, you're on mute. Thanks, Amanda. All right, heading south, we've got some great stats coming from the Corvallis area. This year, we uh, held somewhere around 18 events in Corvallis, um, 169 volunteers, which is really impressive considering that we just started working in Corvallis a couple of years ago uh, with a grant from the city. Um, we started out with like 12 volunteers. So even through COVID, you can see that we've really been building our engagement there. Uh, 544 hours of service, and we often don't talk about hours in service in terms of their dollar value, uh, but the federal government values volunteer hours at $22 an hour. So you can see that we've generated close to $12,000, which we can use as a match for grants in the number of volunteer hours. Um, we've cleaned over 100 yards of trash in the area and removed 244 needles. And most of our work uh, in Corvallis is focused in the Corvallis proper area with city limits. Um, and often we do travel from Crystal Lake uh, to Michael's Landing in the area. And then we focus on specific parks that have some issues with homeless camping or sometimes with dumps or dump sites that we go and take care of um, as uh, the city of Corvallis requests our help. Next slide. I wanted to focus a little bit on partnership because our River Guardians programs and really many of our cleanup programs wouldn't be what they are without the uh, myriad of partners that join us for these efforts. Um, in Corvallis, this is our parks and public works teams um, and our funders, Travel Oregon, Oregon State Parks. But we do often work with outreach teams in the area. Um, this is work that does require a lot of compassion. And in Corvallis, we work with Housing First and we also work with the Street Outreach and Response Team in Benton County Health. Um, Benton County Health was really important when we started in with COVID. Uh, the health units helped us out with COVID tracing, taking temperatures for volunteers, uh, and really helping to uh, provide some of that tracing and reporting, um, and just creating a bit of a, a safer place for volunteers to come and do this work. Uh, and we're also working with neighborhood associations in Corvallis, that would be the Southtown Neighborhood Association. Um, we also work with watershed councils. So in the Corvallis area, we've worked with the Kalapuya Watershed Council, um, who has also helped to implement some of the cleanup programs in Albany uh, as well, um, including Hayek Park and Bowers Rock. Next slide. In Eugene and Springfield, we've had close to 50 events this year. Um, and that would include um, a half dozen events up in the headwaters around Jasper Bridge, Oak Ridge, West Fur, uh, and Lowell. Um, we have engaged with 398 volunteers, um, implementing almost 1400 service hours with over $30,000 in volunteer match time, 147.5 yards of trash and over 500 needles removed. Uh, the good news about this is that last year, just in Eugene Springfield, we removed over 700 needles. Maybe it just means that we didn't get more this year because maybe we just didn't see them or someone else cleaned them up, but that's a good number for me. Um, again, this wouldn't be what it is without our partners. Uh, we have a very strong relationship with the city of Eugene who's funded the program for a few years. Um, we also work with the rec team who provides boats um, as well as city shuttles, um, which have been extremely helpful during COVID um, to be able to use COVID safe transportation. And uh, sorry, a little distracted by the chat box there. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. Um, we've also been working with the Department of State Lands and White Bird Medical Clinic and HIV Alliance. Um, we'll learn a little bit more about that partnership later. And um, 
We've also got some great federal partnership with the Forest Service and then again, watershed councils like the Middle Fork and Coast Fork. Um, we also have some great participation with our community businesses. So in Corvallis, we have Peak Sports, which have provided meals for our volunteers afterwards, and then some of the smaller coffee houses. Um, and in Eugene, uh, we have some uh, larger sponsors that work with us on the Great Willamette cleanup as well, including Willamette Valley Alchemy, Mountain Rose Herbs, REI, Planktown Brewing, and Emberex. Uh, and so we strive to, if you have a business or a small business and you're on the, the webinar tonight, we uh, strive to include as many businesses as possible um, in our business sponsorship program and would love to have you on board to help out with that. Next slide. Uh, this slide just looks a little bit at where our landing spots are. So some of these places are parks where we will do land cleanups and then other places represent our put in or take out areas. Uh, but all the way up to the Jasper Bridge, we have cleaned the river miles from the Beltline to the Jasper, Jasper Bridge area. So that's a, that's a lot of river miles that we've, we've managed to clear out. Okay. Next slide. Some other pieces of our River Guardians program that are beneficial both for our volunteers, but also just for the greater river recreation community is that we provide some education around trauma-informed communications and needle safety. In the last couple of years, we've done this work with Benton County Health and Whitebird Medical Clinic leading the uh, charge on the seminar or educational classes for these needs. Um, another rec, uh, educational opportunity we have is with the American Canoe Association and the City of Eugene Rec Team. And each year they present river recreation and rescue safety classes. And what's great about this is that it really empowers our volunteers, some of who come to the river, uh, often for their first experience behind the oars or behind the paddles. And then in receiving some of this education, it allows them to get out on the water on their own also safely. Next slide. Another great aspect of the work of the River Guardians program is that we are building leadership around advocacy. And basically the folks involved as volunteers, when they start to get more involved, they wanna come out and help solve some of these real world problems um, by facing our decision makers and having a voice at public meetings. So we are currently working on uh, some of the issues around river development in the Springfield area. We're working on the Glenwood uh, Riverfront Development Project. In the past, we've worked on the U of O North Campus Project and providing a voice for that. We participated in the city of Eugene's uh, Riverfront Charrettes to help uh, shape the vision of what the new Eugene Riverfront Park would look like. Um, but in addition to development, we've also worked with DSL to develop camping rules in riparian areas to help determine where camping is and is not appropriate within the Eugene city limits. Um, and then we have also, um, we've also had some of our folks go in and just talk to our city councilors one-on-one -on -one, or we have brought city councilors out to some of the cleanups. Next slide. Uh, we also do, as I mentioned earlier, the aquatic invasive weeds restoration and stewardship uh, alongside our restoration manager and assistant. And sometimes that's taking people out and paddling and surveying where the weeds are located. Um, it's also that our river guardians, when we are out on the water doing cleanups, uh, we do make a note of where we are seeing specific weeds out on the water. Uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier, we implement paddle and pole and ID removal, and again, planting natives and seeding. Next slide. Aside from the River Guardians program, Amanda and I both work on outreach and community engagement projects. For the last few years, uh, I've been able to direct the Willamette River Festival. Uh, we had a great turnout this year, despite COVID and going about half digital and half in-person events. Um, we were able to reach almost 1,500 participants in 2021. And with small group uh, projects and paddles, 
uh, we brought out over 330 brand new paddlers. So that's getting people out on the water to have a good time, creating that sense of connection, that sense of wanting to care for the river. Uh, we also deepened our, con our, our connection with the indigenous communities here. Um, and in working with them, we put on a big theater, an outdoor theater this year. Uh, we worked with a couple of the watershed councils and had a big stormwater art camp project um, that was on display uh, throughout the Springfield Mill Race area, Eugene Riverfront um, and Fern Ridge area. And we also increased our online engagements. So we, we had a really big festival this year, really proud of that and super grateful for uh, the sponsors that were part of that this year and look forward to next year. Next slide. Um, another program that we offer is our discovery paddles. And again, despite COVID, we were actually able to host quite a number of them this year, um, which included the Pride Paddle, an Autumn Equinox Paddle, a Tree Talk and Educational Paddle with our restoration team and Friends of Trees, the Alton Baker Canoe Canal Paddle, um, some more uh, informational and educational paddle, uh, the Willamute Indigenous Interpretive Paddle, the Wild Diversity Paddles, um, again, another training opportunity with another nonprofit, and the Lane Migrant Education Paddles, um, which we are looking forward to hosting more of them come 2022. Next slide. Um, so a bit about what's next. Um, again, we're looking forward to 2022, uh, moving further away from COVID, or at least being able to implement safe practices as we do move forward with our programs. Um, more discovery paddles come 2022, and then continuing our Spring for Your River, the Great Willamette cleanup, and lots of cleanups in between. Uh, within Portland, we do two cleanups a month um, that kick off in early spring. Um, in Salem area, it'll be one cleanup a month, and then Michelle's running her program year-round. So there's a lot of opportunities to be able to join in the work that we are doing. Um, and um, once I get on the moment on the chat, I will drop in more information about the cleanup that's taking place tomorrow for folks interested in joining in Portland. Um, the best place to stay up to date, though, is always um, on our website. We're always uploading the upcoming events there, as well as on our social medias, Facebook and Instagram, um, and our monthly newsletters are all best place to stay up to date. And that is all. Thank you, uh, Michelle and Amanda. That was great. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Heather. I was talking on mute. <laughs> Doom fatigue. Anyway, um, we're super thankful for everybody that's here. Just right before we start our question and answer with um, the teams that presented today, I would be remiss in my job if I didn't let you know about ways that you could support the work that we've been talking about today. So Amanda's going to drop in the chat a number of ways in which that you could support our organization. Um, we are a part of Give Guide this year, which is Willamette Week's uh, partnership with over 200 nonprofits in the Portland area. And uh, we have some really cool incentives this year from our business partners, um, including uh, Wild, North Drinkware, Union Wine, Next Adventure. Um, you can get lots of cool stuff. If you donate today, you can actually win a gift certificate, get entered to win a gift certificate for a tattoo. You can also give on our website if you're interested in donating um, from your family foundation or your IRA or even cryptocurrency, you can just drop me an email and we can chat about how you can do that. Um, but most and most most importantly, I'd just like to thank people who are already supporters, whether you volunteer or give financially or both. Uh, we couldn't we couldn't do our mission without you. And I think that what um, Amanda and Michelle and Richard and Vanessa shared tonight is very but it makes it very apparent that we can't do the work without our volunteers, the volunteer hours and the work that you put in. So without further ado, we will go to questions. So I believe the first question was for uh, Richard and Vanessa, which is uh, what is the prevalence of beaver along the Willamette and what has their influence been in the area's hydrology? So beaver, we, we love our beaver, even though they pull up our, our and eat our plants that we've really, the young things that we're trying to grow. Um, it's very rare to actually see the beaver. It's much more common to see beaver evidence. 
This last year we had uh, a, an active beaver building a dam and habit, habiting a Gale Ackerman wildlife area. Unfortunately, by the end of the summer, we didn't see a lot of activity. We saw activity of Nutria, which are competitors. So we struggle a little bit with that. Um, one of the amazing things that I saw in the spring of 2019, after the April floods had come through, was um, <clears throat> there was evidence of beaver about 15 feet up in the trees that they'd had, eat, they'd had been eating the cambium um, and gnawing away at the trees while the flood was raging. And then after the waters receded, you could still see sign of them well above your head. And so they're out there, they're doing, um, they're doing good work on the Willamette. I'll, I'll, I'll move really briefly back to the Gail Ackerman Wildlife Area and that one of uh, Oregon Department and Fish and Wildlife projects is to actually cut some trees in the, um, not the back channel, but some of the super high water channels to replicate beaver fall. And that then slows down the water, allows nutrients to accumulate, a lot of sediment to accumulate and diverts water and, and, and just makes it a little bit more habitable for fish. So we like them as part of the ecosystem. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, I, would, I would just add on one thing to that is that there's been a big movement and we probably heard about it recently in relation to fires, the benefits of beavers can provide in the upper tributaries and pretty much everywhere. Um, and unfortunately in the state of Oregon, beavers don't have much protection. They're viewed typically as a nuisance animal and that's been an issue that's been brought up in the legislature over and over to try to change some of these policies that allow trapping and killing routinely. Um, but the last legislative session, be, uh, there were multiple bills related to kind of changing that up or at least modifying how we view them and how we uh, consider what to do when beavers are uh, becoming a problem on a landowner's property. And those bills did not even get a hearing. So it was a, a pretty pathetic showing, uh, not in that discussion on a negative note, but the good thing is that there are a lot of folks who are trying to work on that issue throughout the state and, and throughout the West. So I think the tide is turning in terms of the appreciation of those animals. So just I throw that out there too. Thank you, Travis. Um, so just a reminder, everybody, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. You can also use the, um, the reaction uh, thing on the bottom of your screen to raise your hand. Um, so we have two questions for um, our, our uh, River Guardians program. So the first one is how many participants in a uh, how many participants in a cleanup team and what percentage of cleanup events involve canoes and kayaks? Um, so the answer is going to vary a bit between um, both the areas that I work and where Michelle's working. Um, so to answer for the Portland Salem area, our events are um, can be anywhere between five people um, to around 20 is pretty common. Um, so usually fairly small and then definitely plenty of space to spread out in the area that we are working. So very COVID friendly as well. Um, and the second part of the question, what percentage of them are on the water? Um, the majority that we host within Portland and Salem are actually on land. Um, and it would be uh, maybe a couple sprinkled in here and there that are taking place via canoe and kayak. And um, when we are working on canoe and kayak, um, a majority of those events will be um, We'll have Willamette River Keeper canoes that are available to borrow for folks that don't have their own boats. Um, and when we are working with boats, it's usually headed over to Ross Island within the Portland area or over to Minto Brown in Salem. And in the uh, Corvallis area, um, I'd say about 50% of the work we do is from the water. We have two rafts that we generally bring down. So if folks don't have their own boat or don't feel comfortable paddling on the river, we do have seats in the rafts so that folks without a watercraft can participate as well as people with their own watercraft. Uh, the same thing in Eugene, although I would say probably more like 75% of the work that we do is by water. Uh, we work very closely with the Willamette Kayak and Canoe Club. And so much of the upper area, um, any headwaters work that we do that's on the water is going to be done um, in conjunction with uh, that particular group because we ask that anyone paddling their own boat has class two experience. 
Um, again, we, um, we have a couple of rafts that we can get uh, first time paddlers or folks who aren't comfortable paddling in class two water. Um, and the city of Eugene joins us for most of our trashy Tuesdays. They generally bring another couple of rafts um, and everyone, we all, we provide all the PFDs that are necessary and, and any other paddling means necessary for those as well. So we try to make it as safe as possible and set expectations because it's not a learn to paddle event when you go out on the cleanups. Great, awesome. Um, so Mark asked, um, do any of your cleanups occur when there are active, where there are active camps? And if so, how do you prepare for and manage interactions with camp residents? You want me to take this one, Amanda? Yeah, I think um, I can speak to the Portland areas when you're done, but if you wanna start it off. Sure. Um, well, we generally, we work with our stakeholders. So in our area, we generally work with the city of Eugene or with Willamette Lane Parks and Recreation District to target a specific place, which means it's been posted and more often than not, it's, it's abandoned camps that are there and not occupied camps. But as we all know, uh, posting a camp doesn't guarantee that people will move out um, and people can move out one day and the next they can move back in. So we do encounter a ban we do encounter occupied camps, but we do not go into occupied camps and clean them up. Uh, we do sometimes when it's questionable, we may announce ourselves. Um, and that's where the trauma informed communications training uh, comes in and is very valuable because we do run into campers. Um, and sometimes we're able to drop off garbage bags for people or take full garbage bags uh, and uh, you know, bring them where they need to be in order to be properly disposed. Uh, and we've also actually worked with some of the homeless campers to help monitor trash in specific places, or we've asked them to put their bags out and we've come back later and pick those bags up. Um, we aren't there to enforce anything. Uh, we're just there to you know, help keep the river clean and hopefully instill some stewardship along the way. Um, I don't know if you wanna to add to that, Amanda? Yeah, um, my answer is very similar within the Salem area. Actually, that's not something that we have um, necessarily navigated in the spaces that we have been cleaning up. Um, very different in Portland and pretty similar to what Michelle had said, we're working quite a bit with the city. Um, we definitely are not cleaning up active camps, but there are a lot of spaces that are close proximity to where there are people living. Um, but we will announce ourselves um, and have had conversations where people are interested in getting involved and helping us pick up in the areas that we are working in. Um, and yeah. I guess I just jump into working in the Corvallis area. We've actually worked specifically with Corvallis Housing First and the Corvallis uh, Street Outreach and Response Teams and Benton County Health to post uh, and, and have that, those groups communicate with the homeless campers. And then we'll have a group of volunteers that'll come in and they have worked side by side with the homeless residents to get areas clean. So um, it's not that we don't work in active camps at all, but we only work in active camps with the appropriate partners to do so. Okay, great. And um, we have uh, another question from John. He said, when cleaning river or when cleaning the river, are sanitary concerns for volunteers addressed. Yeah, definitely. Um, with each cleanup, there's um, an opening and safety speech that Michelle and I will both give um, to address all safety concerns that we might be um, running into throughout the event. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, we also provide things like safety glasses. Um, we have uh, nitrile gloves as well as work gloves that are provided. Uh, we provide all the trash bags. Um, and so, yes, we do. And we talk about like, you know, how much trash to put into a bag so that they're not too heavy. Um, and also in our trauma-informed communications trainings, um, they actually do talk about like sometimes where you're in areas where there's large piles of trash, there's a way to kind of go through that a lot more safely than just obviously sticking your hand in a pile of trash. So um, we do have like actual trainings as well. Um, that John, or the person that asked that question gave you a thumbs up. So clearly he liked your answer. Um, 
that looks like that's all the questions that are in the chat. Is there anybody else that would like to ask a question of um, our teams that are on the call tonight? I guess it's not a call, it's a webinar. Um, just a reminder that Travis is gonna do a year end roundup um, in December. So if you haven't signed up for that webinar yet, you probably should, cause it'll be fun. Um, last year it was a happy hour. So I'm gonna assume that this year it will be as well. Um, but with, if no one has anything else to say, um, I think our whole team um, would like to say a huge thank you to everybody who came tonight. Um, we really appreciate your support and uh, showing up to hear all about the amazing work that we've done over the past couple of years. Travis, did you want to say anything to close? No, just uh, thanks everybody. We appreciate you taking some time tonight and uh, look forward to seeing as many of you as we can in 2022. And thank you for supporting our work. It's much appreciated. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Hi, dear. Oh, I knew that was my mom. Hi. so good. Great information. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Did you learn some stuff? <laughs> I did. Oh, my goodness. I'm so impressed with the organization. Fantastic. I actually got to meet Amanda's mom at the Jackson Brown concert randomly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but my mom and David just popping up here and there. Yeah. <laughs> good fun. Nice surprise. Yeah. That was a good surprise. I love that. I told my parents they would have to be anonymous because I'd be more nervous if they were there. Did you so. see that I changed Scott's name? I yes, saw that. I changed it to Anon. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I should have changed multiple people, Sam, so you wouldn't know who he was. I didn't, I didn't know you could do that. I have the power. power. <laughs> Love it. Well, good job, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Have a good night, and uh, we'll see a couple of you tomorrow morning.